Hi, I'm Lee Ehrenberg, and I'd like to welcome you to another event of The Living Room. The following program was recorded at the Santa Monica Public Library and is brought to you in collaboration between the library, the Friends of the Library, City TV, and the California State Library. Now sit back and enjoy. Hello, everyone. All right, good energy here. I am delighted to be here today to talk about one of my favorite topics. Uh, before we start, or let's say as we start, I'd like to share a story with you. Um, this is a story about the kernel of Kentucky Fried Chicken. And apparently, sales were off for three straight months. So the kernel called the Pope and asked a favor. The Pope says, what can I do? And the Colonel says, I need you to do the following. Would you change the daily prayer from give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken? And if you do, I will donate $10 million to the Vatican. The Pope says, you know, I'm sorry. That's the Lord's Prayer. I, I really can't change the words. Well, another month goes by, and the sales are really dismal. The Colonel panics. And he calls again. He says, listen, Your Ex Excellency, I will donate $50 million to the Vatican if you change the words from give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. The Pope replies, you know, this is so tempting. We could do so much with that money, feed the poor, feed the hungry, support more charities, but unfortunately, I must decline. Well, two more months go by, and now the sales are absolutely dreadful. And the colonel is desperate. Your Excellency says, this is my last offer. <clears throat> if you change the words from give us our daily bread to give us our daily chicken, I will donate $100 million to the Vatican. The Pope says, let me get back to you. <laughs> so the next day, the Pope calls his bishops together and says, gentlemen, I have some good news and I have some bad news. The good news is that Kentucky Fried Chicken is going to donate $100 million to the Vatican. The bad news is that we just lost the Wonder Bread account. <laughs> so everybody is into marketing. Everybody is into marketing, so products, goods, services, advice. And I guess I am here to market the importance of women in transition. And I think that's what I'm marketing today. Before we get into our program piece, I want to get a sense of who's here. How many people cons here consider themselves retired? Okay. How many consider themselves employed? How many are unemployed? How many are looking for work? Okay. Okay, so the remarks and the time we spend together is really directed to transition and change. And it has a message for those look, who are employed, looking to the future, those who are already retired, and maybe we can even find something about employment in here for the rest. <clears throat> I want to do three things with you today. <clears throat> First, as you can see, our title is The New Retirement. So I thought it would be reasonable to first talk about what is this new retirement. We mentioned women. Um, I'd like then to talk a little bit about where we've come so far. And then I'd like to end up with this particular project called Project Renewment. So in a sense, we're setting the stage, understanding this new concept, the new retirement, where women have come from, and what's facing us and how we can face today and the future. Okay, let's begin with trends. Let me talk about trend, num trend number one. Trend number one is clearly retirement involves more years for a lot of reasons. One, there's an increase in life expectancy. In 1900, life expectancy was 47. 100 years later, a little over 100 years later, life expectancy is 78. This is an unprecedented gain. 
And if we assume that people are going to live longer and they're going to take traditional retirement at 62 and 65, then we can say retirement's going to be longer than we thought. We used to think of retirement as 20 to 25 years. Now it can go 30 to 35 years. In fact, you can have traditional retirement longer than your primary work. The other new piece is, another new piece is more people are living to be 100. I don't know if any of you have gotten your most recent US News and World Report, How to Live to 100. The entire, the entire magazine is devoted to how one lives to 100 and understanding the science behind it. What I'd like you to notice is actually the third, well, the second bullet. Today we have about 70,000 centenarians. And if we jump forward to 2050, look at the percentage of centenarians that are going to be women. It's a big message for women. 82% are anticipated to be female. So let's look at trend number two. Trend number two, now first we said retirement is going to have more years. Now I'm going to say something totally contradictory, and that is retirement may have fewer years, particularly traditional retirement. If we assume that life expectancy stays the same and people are going to work longer, it might be that traditional retirement may be history. It may be we're going to be the first generation where a huge segment of population are never going to retire. Let's look at trend three. It's hard to talk about retirement without talking about work. In fact, we have a new category of people that have emerged. We call them the working retired. Anyone here consider themselves the working retired? Okay. It's not an oxymoron. Not an oxymoron. And it, a lot of the research said that people, people worked in retirement to stay mentally fit, to have structure in their lives, to have a purpose. Well, that's still true, but today, what is it that people are working for? Income, absolutely. And typically we would have what's called the three-legged stool of retirement. Tell me what they are. What's the first one? Social Security, what's the second? Pension, what's the third? Savings, now what's the fourth? Work, employment, huge change. That is now becoming the fourth stool of retirement, the fourth leg of retirement. What I want you to notice is first the gray line. These are people 65 and over, and I want you to just look at the gray line, how that's increasing. Now look at the blue line. That's those 55 to 64. You see that's also increasing. This is actually a national trend. And it's hard to talk about um, aging and the future without also talking about women and aging and poverty. And this is a pretty serious issue. We know that one in four women who are 65 and over are living on incomes below $14,500. That's 150% of what the poverty level is. And we know that older women are far more likely to be poor than men. Look at the poverty rate for those 65 and over. Women, 11.5%, men, 6.6%. And poverty is around $10,000. Now, we've come a long way. Those rates have improved. But when we talk about aging and we talk about poverty, it's essentially a women's issue, a challenge we face. Before we leave the subject of economics, we are in an economic tsunami. About $2 trillion have been lost in retirement savings. And even those companies that have defined contribution plans, less than 70% are contributing to them. And this is really the first time in history where large numbers of retirees with fixed income cannot afford to continue in their retirement. But there is hope. We end on a positive note. But we need a little bit dose here of reality. And as we talk about work, it's not such an easy thing. He's getting older, though. I'm thinking of having his eyes done. Um, <laughs> the issue of how, particularly in Southern California, with the Hollywood influence, how one looks and how one appears in a job interview, unfortunately, seems to have some weight. So the whole, the whole issue of looking your age becomes a big subject. And just a comment about pensions. This was a cover story 
um, the New York Times Magazine, we regret to inform you that you no longer have a pension. It's not that you don't have as much as you thought, but you don't have a pension. And this affected men as well as women. And we know only about half of employees in America actually even have a pension. Um, there is an organization called the Pension Benefit Guarantee Orp Corporation. It is a federal insurance agency that insures the pension of companies. That agency is currently running a $33.5 billion deficit. Pretty serious. Let's look at trend number four. Trend number four is that retirement is being encouraged. Why? Well, first of all, who, who has the highest salary in an organization? Typically, people who have worked there the longest, and usually if you work there the longest, you also are older. We also know retirement is being encouraged because many companies are downsizing, and we're working in an arena right now, an environment where we admire if we can do more with less. And unfortunately, <clears throat> younger folks do have an advantage. Age discrimination in the workplace is illegal, um, but unfortunately, it still, it still uh, occurs. Now, I'm going to tell you something totally different. I said retirement is encouraged, contradiction. At the same time, retirement is being discouraged because there's still certain industries that have skill shortages. Uh, for example, the whole healthcare field. Ph there's a tremendous shortage of pharmacists. There is a shortage of x-ray technologists. There is a shortage of, of IT workers. Um, so in some particular industries and professions, retirement is being discouraged. And then there is a concern among some employers that we're going to have this huge wave of boomers that are going to all retire at once, and there will be a labor force shortage. We'll see if that plays out. And then there are others who say it's really important to discourage retirement because we need more people working. We need more people paying into the Social Security Fund. We need more people uh, contributing to the gross domestic product. So that's trend five. Trend six deals with expectations. Regardless of what's happening in our environment, expectations from that next life chapter are still really high. I've worked with over 10,000 employees on the non-financial aspects of their future. I have yet to hear one say, you know what I'd like in my life? Less fun, less opportunity, less money, fewer friends, less choices. Expectations are high. And I think that's reflected in three, in the next two organizations which have emerged in the past several years. One is called the Transition Network. Anyone ever hear that? Transition Network. This comes out of New York. It's a membership organization of women who are in mid to later life. Most of them have had careers or very significant volunteer uh, commitments. And they provide networking opportunities, speakers, interest groups, opportunities for philanthropy. Um, and there are about 2,000 now across the 2,000 members, and they have about 10 or 11 chapters. So they're based out of New York. It's called the Transition Network. Here in Southern California, we have an organization called Women's Sage. It was founded by Jane Glenn Haas, who writes for the Orange County Register. They have about six, 700 members. They're also a membership organization, and they do a lot for their members, particularly in helping in employment. They do transition makeovers. They do respite care for caregivers and take them on a cruise. They're very uh, member-oriented, and they're in, um, in Orange County. And then the third is Project Renewment, which I will talk about a little later, which is really the first, we, we call it the first retirement model for career women. And this attracts career women or those who are very engaged in volunteer activities, even some of those who are retired, who are looking at their next 30 years and how to approach that, that period of time. So our six trends. We know retirement involves more years, and it involves fewer years. We know people are working longer. We know retirement is being discouraged as well as being encouraged, and we know expectations are high. If I had to identify the two most significant trends, the most significant is that working longer and working in retirement, and the second one is expectations are high. Our parents may have been satisfied when the house is paid for, children are married, grandchildren are doing great, 
everyone is healthy, meeting their bills, and life is good. This generation of retirees sees their future differently. They are still looking for peak experiences. And when I say they, I'm talking about us. Can anyone relate to that? Peak experiences in the next chapter? Anyone happy with the status quo? Maybe a little peace. A peace would be okay. We'd like a little peace. We'd like a little security. But we're still looking for that rich, uh, invigorating next chapter of life. So with that, let's move to our next session. And I want to talk a little bit about women, per se. Where have we come from? A little bit about history. What's kind of brought us to this point? Well, women have a long history of being known as the weaker sex. And it's not just in the past 10, 50, or 100 years. Let's go back to the Mayflower time. The colonists at that time believed that women were morally, intellectually, and physically inferior. And what they needed to do was to get married as soon as possible so that their husbands could keep them on the straight and narrow. Now we move on to another group. These are the colonial folks, and they were farm wives. Now their status increased a little bit for a really good reason. They worked very hard, and they made everything. They made candles and soap and butter and cheese, and they would spin the yarn and dye the yarn and then sew the clothing, and they made shoes, and they made hats. And so they did everything so that their husband and 14 children could survive. So their rating went up a little. Then came the Industrial Revolution when families moved from the farm to the city. And again, the status of women was raised a bit. And at that period of time, the women were focusing on house cleaning, housekeeping, and nurturing their children. But the general theme was that men provided and protected, and women served and deferred. Does that for sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> OK, all right. I want to tell you a story that is part of a very interesting book that I'd recommend. It's called When Everything Changed, The Amazing Journey of American Women from 1960 to the Present by Gail Collins. She's an op-ed columnist for the New York Times, and it just came out at the end of 2009. She tells the story of Lois Rabinowitz, 1960. Lois Rabinowitz was a 28-year-old secretary to an oil executive in New York. Her boss got a parking ticket, and her boss asked Lois, would you please go to court and pay this parking ticket for me? That day, Lois happened to wear slacks, very neatly pressed, and a crisp white blouse. Well, the magistrate was quite outraged and said to her, do you appreciate that you are in a courtroom in slacks? And he sent her home. And she gave the ticket and the payment to her husband, who paid the bill. And what, what uh, Gail Collins says is that it was a message that women should not wear the pants in the family. And this magistrate said to her, you know, I've always put women on a pedestal, and your appearance today has really shaken that pedestal. So what Collins says, this is, I mean, these facts are checked by the New York Times folks. And what, what, what Collins says is that, women should have, that the notion was that women should remain on the pedestal and should not have any authority or role or literally wear the pants in the family. This is 1960. Can anyone remember 1960? Let me just check. Okay. <laughs> I want to just check the generation here. <clears throat> Let's continue with 1960. Newsweek was interested why housewives were dissatisfied. And the analysis was it was because of the female cycle. This was kind of an emotional limitation, unpredictability, um, and you could attribute all the ills of women essentially to the female cycle. And at the same time, they credited Freud with, with saying, anatomy is actually destiny. So ladies, you're just stuck with what you have, and there you go. But there were other myths. If you recall, it was not until recently that women were included in the Boston Marathon. And one of the officials was overheard saying that it's actually unhealthy for women to run long distances. Anyone here a marathon runner? Okay. 
Um, I don't know, if, for those of you who went to college, can you recall many female professors? No. Not a lot. <clears throat> Not a lot. And can any of you remember Howdy Doody? Okay. Do you remember the character Princess Summerfall Winter Spring? Okay. Collins made an interesting observation. First of all, she said, the princess was on the show because the network wanted to sell dresses, and you couldn't do that if it was only Howdy Doody and Clarabelle. And the second thing she observed is that the princess sang an occasional song, and then she just watched and observed. She never was really part of the story. She was peripheral, okay? Princess Summerfall, Winter Spring. And there was kind of a message that was sent to women that get married, that is a really good thing, and once you're married, the good life is really the stay-at-home life. Well, then we have what kind of careers did women go into? Well, it was assumed that women would work for a short period of time. In fact, it was assumed among many that when you went to college, it was really important because if you should have to work, if you should have to work, you'd at least be able to do something, okay? So, there was a big um, promotion and appeal to be a stewardess or as known today, flight attendants. I have to tell you, my seventh grade home ec project was to be a stewardess. <laughs> that was my project. I remember I did a big billboard and all the things that stewardess did and it was glamorous and it was exciting. It was seventh grade, that was my goal. So it was a glamorous short term job and it was fairly sexist. There was an executive flight that went from New York to Chicago, and it, the exec, it was for men only, men only. And the men were served steaks and drinks and cigars, and according to Collins, the stewardesses were expected to bend over and light the gentlemen's cigars. Expected behavior. They, in retrospect, say they really objected. They were weighed constantly. They were measured constantly and they had to be single. And there was one story where a woman who was married did not tell her boss, and she landed at the destination, and they found out that she was married, and she was summarily fired. There was another qualification, which I never heard of, that you needed white, soft hands. It says something about multiculturalism and diversity if white, soft hands were the most important. Anyone here a flight attendant? No, okay, just checking. Okay, you could not wear glasses or have wide hips, okay? Yes, it was a time. So let's look at 1960 and let's look at working women. 6% <clears throat> were doctors, 3% were lawyers, and less than 1% were engineers. And if there was a woman who wanted to be a journalist, she was forwarded to the women's page. And if there was a physician, female physician, it was automatically assumed she would go into pediatric medicine. Lawyers really didn't have face time. They were they were designated to kind of the backroom law that would deal with real estate and insurance and never appear in court. That was 1960. And then there was a really good story about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who attended Harvard Law School. The dean had a dinner, invited Ginsburg, and said to her, quote, would you please explain what you were doing in law school, taking a place that could be held by a man? As we know, she went on to become a Supreme Court Justice. And then there's the economics, the economic scene. When a couple would want to qualify for a mortgage or a loan, they had to be evaluated in terms of their income. If the wife was 28 years old, the salary was not counted. If the wife was in her 30s, half of her income was counted. If she was, this was shocking, if she was in her 40s, or could prove that she was sterilized, 100% of her salary was counted. The assumption being that you really couldn't count on that salary because you would become pregnant, have a family, you'd quit your job, so it really wasn't a good assessment of your long-term financial security. I mean, this sounds like the dark ages. It, sound, it is the dark ages, actually. And then let's talk about marriage. Median age of marriage was actually 20 years. M many of the women said they wanted four children, and if you weren't married, you were a failure. If you weren't married by the time of 30, 
you were, there was something wrong with you, okay? And if any of you remember from college, Christmas break, what would happen? Those who were pinned by the sorority guys would come back with a ring on their finger. That was kind of anticipated. And then everything changed. <laughs> everything changed. <clears throat> Interesting story about Betty Friedan. Betty Friedan, as you probably know, went to Smith College. <clears throat> and she got a commission from a Coles magazine to write an article in defense of her Smith's College education that it truly prepared women to be good wives good, and good mothers and good partners. That was her assignment. So she, as you know, she did the survey throughout the country, surveyed all of these women, and she was very surprised at the results because they did not say Smith College prepared me for my life. They were depressed, they were isolated, they were miserable, and they shared that information with Betty Friedan, which was the basis for her book of The Feminine Mystique, and Friedan died in 2006 at the age of 85. I have to say, I, she, I taught for 20 years at uh, Andrus Gerontology Center at USC, and she was a guest um, faculty member, and I was invited to speak into her class, and she was a very, what is the word? She had a, an edge to her that made you stand up and pay attention. Um, and she also then had something like a living room series, like a salon in her apartment in Santa Monica, and I was fortunate to be invited. And I have to say, very invigorating, very thought-provoking, and I feel lucky that I had some opportunity to, um, to meet her and interact with her. But let's look at today's statistics. A half of all seats in medical and law school are now occupied by women. They are the dominant gender in pharmacy and veterinary medicine schools. 40% of the dental school graduates are now women, and a third of the chairs in our top orchestras in the U.S. are held by women. So we, come, we have come a long way, no question about it. But we're not there yet. If you look at who makes law partners, only 17% are women, not much of an increase in the past 15 years. Um, if we look at those who are making $100,000 to $200,000 a year, about three quarters of men, a quarter of women, and still the hourly pay for women is about 80, 77 to 80 cents for what men earn for the same jobs. But we're making progress, we're not there yet. All of this is a backdrop to talk to you about how women are facing this next chapter of life. We have a sense we're in the new retirement. We have a sense we've come a long way. And now what's one example, and this is just one example, of something we call Project Renewment. Another story. <clears throat> this all started when my good friend and colleague and co-author, Bernice Browder, who many of you may know, called me up and said, this was 10 years ago, and she said, has anything been done about career women facing retirement? These are women who feel passionate about their work, they identify with their work. Has anything, any research been done, any programs? And I said, to my knowledge, no. She said, well, are you interested? I said, I'm interested on two levels. One, professionally. Two, you're talking about me. I mean, this, I'm looking at my future also. So we had lunch to see if there was anything that we could discuss, and four hours later, we found there was an awful lot to talk about. So that led to a dinner, just a little dinner at her home. And she said, why don't you invite some friends, colleagues who are career women, and, I, and we'll get together at my home and we'll talk. So we had a dinner for four hours, and we said, we have a lot to talk about. And what we found, I'm, I'm thinking of what part to add here. What we found is that many other women in the Los Angeles area found out that we were meeting and discussing these issues confronting career women. They said, we'd like to start a group. It's hard to bring other people into a group, and we said, you know, we'll help you start a group. Well, then another group said, we want to join your group, we'll, we'll help you. Well, P.S., there are now 22 groups of Project Renewment women that are mostly in Southern California and also on the East Coast. Um, we, we knew that we were on to something different. 
And what we wanted to do was discuss issues, but also to generate some knowledge that we could share with other women facing the same kinds of challenges. So we recorded, for about seven years, we recorded all of our discussions. Um, and what followed is interesting. What followed was we realized we didn't like the word retirement. You know, it's, it's, uh, it actually comes from the French word retirer, and it morphs into a number of words that eventually gets to martyr, which means suffering under torture. <laughs> <coughs> so if there's a reason why retirement doesn't feel comfortable to us, there's a pretty good reason. So we made up a word. We made up the word renewment which is a combination of retirement and renewal. And to us, this represented rebirth. It represented choices and vitality and opportunity and not being exclusively defined by others or an environment where we could identify who we are and who, we would, beco who would we become. Therefore, renewment was born. Well, people would ask, well, what is renewment about? We said, I guess we need a mission statement. So we, we wrote a mission statement. We said, it's a forum. It's for career women, but I would add, we have women who are retired or women who are very passionately committed to volunteerism, but essentially for career women 55 and older to use that strategic thinking, to use that creativity, to use that vision, to forge new directions for their future. And this is, the, this is I think, the essential part. That is, if not more, it, that is equally if not more satisfying than their previous working years. And that gets into expectations for this next chapter of life. Does it resonate? So let's talk about what is it. Well, one, it's a forum where women get together to talk about um, important issues. One moment here. This is about eight to 10 women who will gather around a dining room table in someone's home to talk about retirement and post-retirement living. It's a process where, where women take that energy that they devoted to their careers and now transfer that to redefining themselves and that with creativity into the next chapter. And the other thing is it's a movement. It is not a traditional support group. We don't fix people, okay? Um, it is not therapy. Okay. It's much more of a growth discussion group. And people who come into the group, I would say, have their act together. Okay? We operate from a position of strength. That doesn't mean there aren't issues, and it doesn't mean that we're not supportive, but it is not a traditional support group. And it's also a movement in that we don't have membership or fees or board of directors. And actually, this was a very intentional decision that we did not, we have a number of uh, executive directors and retiring executive directors, and they said, why would we want to do this again? We're trying to get away from this. You know, we don't want to raise money. We don't want to do membership drives. And so very, it was a, a very conscious decision. And then there are some who said, it should be a business. You've got a great business to launch. And they said, you know, we're looking for less work. We're not looking for more work. Um, and I have to say, we almost had to be controlled not to over-organize. And I'm going to give you a sidebar story, because any of the women could have done a strategic planning session, could have organized into whatever we wanted to be. But I'll give you a sidebar funny story. The first meeting that we had, um, it was a dinner. And the next time, we said, well, now we have to decide who brings what. They said, wait, too organized. <laughs> Just bring what you want, OK? The dinner was totally white. We had pasta, we had risotto, we had French bread, we had Krispy Kreme donuts, and we said, you know, I think we're taking this lack of organization too far. At the least, we're gonna make food assignments to have a little color on our plate. I think you can ask the question, <clears throat> why does this seem timely in, in, in perspective of kind of the history of women? This is the first time in history we have so many career women retiring. It's called sheer numbers, okay? 
It's also, we're a generation, the first generation to live before the women's movement and after the women's movement. How many of you remember what traditional women's roles were? How many lived it? I mean, and, and it was very rich, it was very good, okay? But then we, we saw the other side, that maybe there's more that we wanted to develop and more that we wanted to become. And the third reason that this is the first and the largest generation of women to define themselves by their work, okay? Now, because of these firsts, we have no role models. Think about that. Well, maybe Mary Kay was a role model. I don't know how many people can relate to Mary Kay. Maybe Madeleine Albright went on to do something, but I don't know how many of us relate to Madeleine Albright. How, how many have mothers who you think are role models for you in retirement? Because that's a gift. That's a gift. But they were of a different generation and a different set of norms. And it's hard to talk about this topic without talking about the baby boomers. What do we know? <clears throat> We know that there are 40 million women who are baby boomers born between 1946 and 1964. A quarter of them are college graduates and a third work in management or professional roles. We know this is a generation of women and men who are moving from what we call success to significance. They are looking for meaning, they're looking for purpose, and they're looking certainly for economic security, but they are very much looking for a sense of, of making a difference making a difference in this life. And then, of course, there's a women's movement that was very much affected by uh, Betty Friedan. And in her research, the women said, you know, there's a problem that has no name. And I think it was a chapter. We have a problem, but we don't have a name for it. And they asked a very resounding question. Is this all there is? Well, jump forward now to 2010, 2000 and 2010, Women today who have had a job, a career, a family, they've done a lot, they, and, and in mid to later life are asking the very same question, is this all there is? So essentially what we have is the maturing of the women's movement. But I have to add one more piece about the silence. Anyone here born before 1946? Okay. We are called members of the silent generation. We're no longer silent folks. But we're called members of the silent generation because there were so few of us. Demographically, we are the smallest generation in history. But we also had some very interesting characteristics. We were incredibly polite, <laughs> very polite. We did not scream and burn the bra, okay? That wasn't quite us. We were very compliant very agreeable, and we were very averse to risk. So what did our generation of women do when we went to college? What did we study? Teaching, nursing, home ec, journalism, journalism hooray, journalism, okay. Psychology, social work, okay. Pretty risk averse, and the men typically went into engineering, they went to shop, right? <laughs> they, um, they also went into business. Okay, so it was a generation that didn't like to take a lot of risks. They also married early. All right, so that's a little about the silence. But the silence had a very important role. And what Bernice and I both agreed upon is that it seems the silence have carved a path, taking a stone, a pebble off that path and creating it and are convinced that the boomers are just gonna rollerblade down that path, okay? But we don't hear much for the silence, but we wanna give the silent generation certainly, um, certainly some credit. So women of Project Renewment, who are they? Well, they are a wide variety of professional and career women. They're business owners, attorneys, psychologists, journalists, social workers, executive directors, um, landscape architects, Parole, parole officers, uh, teachers, a wide variety. And it's had an impact on them. Some people continue working, I'm an example, which is a choice, a conscious choice. Others have shifted, um, shif shifted their life. There was a woman who was an executive director who is now a photographer of, of third world women and men in third world nations. She's got, she's got um, 
uh, shows and stationery and, and has gotten quite a following. We have a woman who was a probation officer who took some acting classes and now performs in the theater and does um, uh, advertisements. We have another woman who was a market researcher who now runs um, a salon forum of sponsoring interesting speakers for women in mid to later life. And women say that this has really had an impact on them in terms of how they think about their future. They have time to reflect, they have time to bounce ideas off of other people, they learn something new, um, and it has been very, very positive. Three quarters of our women are married, and about a third are retired, and two thirds are still working. So it's all about transition and change. So with that, what I'd like to do is share with you some of the topics we cover and I'm going to move down on your level, and this is going to be a discussion time. And we can have a discussion with 150 people. It does work. What I'd like to do is talk to you about some of the topics we cover and see if they resonate with you, and we'll have a little discussion on it. Um, a topic that all of the women <coughs> have addressed is how do you know when to make the retirement decision? Clearly economics, you have to be able to afford to retire. Th there's no question about that, but is there something more? Um, sometime people retire because of poor health. It's kind of an internal kind of thing. Sometime it's external, such as maybe I don't want to be here anymore, okay? And what we, th in fact, one of our women said, it was easier to make the decision to divorce my husband than it was to make the decision to retire. <laughs> it's truth. It's a quote, it's a quote. And what we found, women talked about the clues. There were some clues that said, you know, maybe it's time to retire. Some clues in the workplace. And so instead of my sharing those clues, with, let's, let's talk about this. What are some clues that would say, you know, I think it's time, it's time for me to retire? Okay, any, yes. Or do we need it in the mic? I guess we do for recording purposes. So let's hustle. Yes. I'm now a stage director, got it. <coughs> yes. Hi, my name is Liz, and I've been retired for a year and a half, and I made the decision when my supervisor, who was 10 years younger than I am, started to give me a lot of hassle about my job and my job performance that I had been doing for 14 <laughs> years. It was worth $2 billion to my company. And he said, well, you really can do something more than that while you're doing that job. And I said, you know, Jim, this is an important job, and it takes my full attention, and it's worth a lot of money, and it involves a lot of people. And he said, well, no, no, you really, you know, you really could do more than more. I went back to my little cube farm and said, you know, I'm going to look at my 401k, and I do have a pension. And I looked at it, and this was pre-disaster, and I said, you know, I could do this. <laughs> and okay. I was re-retirement age, and I basically did it, but it so was an affront to my professionalism okay. and to my ego, I guess. And I said, nah, out yeah, of here. <laughs> thank you, and that's a strong message. It's a strong message, and you kind of assume control over your own life and say, I'm making the decision. Terrific, another, uh, an another one over there, a, a signal that says it was time to retire. Just anyone who has their hand up back there, okay? A sign that says, you know, I think it's time. Hi, my name is Daphne, and I retired. I've only been retired a month, <laughs> and I'm still questioning, what did I do? But the sign was, I worked for the County of LA Department of Children and Family Services, and, uh, and after 20 years, they suddenly decided to change the program. And this was a specialized program where we actually gave direct services to, um, it was a sex abuse treatment program. And I thought, okay. If now they've decided to change the program, maybe it's time for me to change too. I'm at that particular age where I was feeling so stressed, tremendously stressed, and in a lot of uh, pain in, in my stomach. And so that was the decision, and it was very sudden. Okay. Thank you. And so when you can take the microphone back. Um, and so when you start having health symptoms, you say, you know, maybe it's time. Let's have one more. Clues that it's time. A lady down here. You know what? Here. My, my 
Mine's a little different, I think. I've been retired 10 years. I was executive officer for the LA County Board of Supervisors. And at that point in time, the age was just about right. And I was on the top of my game. All the supervisors liked me, which is really important. And things were going well. The budget was doing pretty well. So I cut out. <laughs> there is a time. There is a time. Absolutely. Is there another, someone here? I think one thing that affects you is if the pe uh, the pension formula works, you know, you realize that I will be volunteering if I continue to work. <laughs> That's right. There you go. It pays to leave. Okay. So these are, these are some clues. Now let me ask a different question. Sometime you get a clue that it's not time to leave. It's, it's a clue that, you know, I think I want to stay. Anyone have that in their experience? No one? Do I have a long, sir? Could you? Um, okay, good, there we go. And I really wanted to retire about th two years ago. But then a project came up that I really wanted to be involved in. And I thought, if I can do this, I can retire happily. All right. So, so that's what I did. Okay, thank you. And another clue that says, you know, maybe it's not the right time. I think I want to stay. And uh, unfortunately, we have to go into the mic because of the recording. Lady right here in the stripe. Uh, hi, my name's Mindy Goldberg. M um, uh, speaking for myself and many of my peers, we didn't have children until we were 40 plus. I'm still raising a 21 year old. There is no way on earth I could afford to, to take care of my children without continuing to work. Okay. And right. I'm 65 at the moment. I don't even think about retiring till I'm 70. Okay. And I think you, what you represent is a new model of retirement. Yeah, I couldn't put money away for retirement because I'm putting children through college. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. And the, the woman in the front row here, again, signals that maybe it's time not to retire. Uh, well, uh, my name is Lynn Bronstein, and I am a writer and journalist, and I have a much more atypical background here because I haven't had a salary job in 10 years, and so maybe you could say I'm retired from that unless someone else gives me a salary job, but I've been freelancing for 10 years, and I could never retire as a writer because you just don't. I would only be able to tire, retire if I had senile dementia or was dead. I mean, I, I have to write. I also need to earn a living for the rest of my life as I have no pensions. All the companies I did work for went out of business before I could collect pensions. So I, I have absolutely no money. I'm completely broke. But I can't stop being a writer, so that's the only clue I've got is that, that I'm in that for life. Okay, thank you. All right, so that's a little bit, and I think this is the kind of dialogue, I would say, would, that would go on in a part of a dialogue in, in a renewment group. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Let's see what that next topic is. <laughs> All right, now this is, this is, this is about, about identity. Now I'm going to read you a little piece from the book, and this is a true story. My first trip to a department store after retirement was on a weekday afternoon. It felt strange since I never went shopping during the week in daylight hours. My quest was to buy a new lipstick. I wandered over to the cosmetic counter where I ran into a former member of my board of directors. I had hoped that I would not bump into anyone, let alone a person who had only known me in my professional capacity. If only I could have told her that I was on a mission for a famous visiting dignitary who realized she was without a lipstick. <laughs> and then it happened. How was your retirement, she asked. I'm not retired, I snarled. You might have thought she had asked me, how do you like your new career as a topless dancer? <laughs> I'm uh, doing some consulting, I informed her. Well, she said, do you have a business card? I said, um, I didn't, even though uh, I was consulting. And I felt like I really didn't have a job, particularly without my card. So part of this is, um, is an issue of identity. And when leaving something that's really important to you and you move to that next frame of life, what happens to the identity? Particularly, as I mentioned, we're the first generation of women who have identified by our work and other people identify us by that. So how many people here currently have business cards? 
Okay. All right. It's kind of part of the, even if one isn't working, there's a calling card, right? <laughs> calling card, which is how business cards actually started as calling cards. Um, Sometimes that's a challenge. Um, when you're out socially, what's the first thing that someone asks you? <laughs> what do you do? Okay. And then after that, and you say, well, I'm retired. And then what's the next thing they ask you? <laughs> oh, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> the question keeps going. What do you, do you really like retirement? And then you say, of course, it's the most wonderful thing in the world. Because really, that's all they want to hear. You say, it's fabulous. I don't know how I ever had time to work. It's just the best. It goes on and on. So it's part of our social expectation. We did have a couple of um, very creative women who one created a card and said, I am a manager in charge of everything, executive manager in charge of everything. Another woman was a golf enthusiast and handed out golf tees with her name on it. <laughs> so, so I guess part of the challenge is for us to identify ourselves um, by who we are and not having the external world identify us as much. We have another slide, Bunny. So then we say, well, We've always been productive. Now, what does productivity mean in this next chapter of life? Now, formally, productivity is a measure of output and efficiency. And the, the drive to be productive does not necessarily change or stop if we don't work. That's kind of an internal drive, OK? Um, but there's a big change. When we're in the workplace, we have performance reviews. Objectives are set, and we know how we're doing. Someone else is making that decision based on certain criterion. When we're not in the workplace, we don't have a performance review. So I have to say, I have a sister whom I adore. When she calls me from Philadelphia, she says, Helen, how are you? I'm fine. She said, did you have a productive day? <laughs> and I usually say yes, but I find it an interesting question. Um, we found that our women define productivity um, very personally. Uh, they, they determine kind of, in they, they develop their own criteria of what productivity is. It could be mi taking care of an aging parent. It could be visiting a sick friend. It could be going to a yoga class. It could be learning about something brand new. It could be going back to school. But they, over time, said, this is productive. This is worthwhile. And we do know we're a work-driven society. Productivity, I mean, go back to the Puritans. Do not waste time. Idle hands are sinful. Um, productivity is part of the American culture. So the question is, how do we define that for ourselves in that next chapter of life? Next slide. One of our women said that <coughs> that she mourned that she was not the superwoman she used to be. Now, I don't know if any of you have experienced this notion of a little bit less energy. <laughs> How many of us can really admit it? My hand is down. It's a very tough thing. I ha I, I, I'm a slow learner. Um, I can't understand if I work very late at night and very hard where I can't get up 6 o'clock in the morning and just continue. Surprise. Or you take a trip to the East Coast, and you don't know why the next morning somehow you just want to arrange paper clips and make phone calls. <laughs> I'm in the field of aging. All right, I, I know better. It's hard. But it's also difficult to admit, and I would say it's difficult to admit in the workplace. If you go to the workplace and say, God, I'm really exhausted, it doesn't play well because there is an age stereotype in the workplace where energy is synonymous with youth. We need some young, energetic, new blood in this organization, okay? To make the assumption that we're not energetic is also, um, is also wrong. And in the 2007 marathon, and I don't have the stats for 2008 or 9, 1,500 people finished the marathon who were 60 and over, and there was an 87-year-old woman who finished the marathon. And there are things we know we can do to e enhance our energy, and you know all of it, exercise, nutrition, stress management, rest, et cetera. But 
it is hard to deal with having a little less steam in your engine. We can compensate for it, um, but we don't talk about it a lot, do we? Okay, let's go to the next slide. I won't earn another dollar. We do talk about finances, but this particular essay, and what I did mention is the, sidebar, the book has three sections. One is, why are we talking about this irrationale? And then there are 38 essays, each with kind of a, an illustration, and essays are maybe a thousand words. And each of the topics are topics that have been covered in our women's groups. And then the third section is, if you want to start a project renewment group, we'll provide the curriculum. We got the topics, the questions, add your own to the list, what makes a group work, facilitating, how many is an optimum number, et cetera. But I won't earn another dollar it was really based on a woman who, who said she was not prepared to begin drawing from her retirement account and not putting anything in. It's that moment when you no longer have a check coming in it's an emotional moment. I don't know if it's a objective financial moment, but it's an emotional moment saying, I keep drawing. You know, I keep withdrawing. And our attitudes towards money really go back very much to our experiences, to our family experiences. You might remember, and I don't know if your parents did this, there were certain principles. Never pay interest. Never spend the principal, which I'm not sure is always the best advance financial advice. And as we look at our economy today, Maybe some of that, and save, 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 save. Uh, maybe some of that, quote, old-fashioned advice um, probably wasn't so old-fashioned. Could we go to another slide? Mm -hmm. Well, I lost my keys <laughs> and my car. <laughs> you know you're getting older when getting lucky means you find your car in the parking lot. <laughs> It was light when I started shopping and pitch black when I left the stores with my shopping bags. I was sure I knew where I parked the car. I pulled out my keys and pushed the unlock button on the key ring, waiting to hear beep and see the blinking headlights emanating from my car. I saw nothing and I heard silence. So the words, so were the words of an experienced project renewment shopper, okay? Um, the notion of brain health is a very contemporary, a very important topic. And the good news is we've learned a lot, just as we know the impact of exercise and its impact on aging and slowing the aging process and some even perhaps extending aging with increased telomeres at the end of our chromosomes. Uh, we know that there is such a thing called brain health where there is evidence that use it or lose it is true. Um, we certainly know that this has become an industry with Cognifit, with Posit Science, with, with some of the other uh, Nintendo that is now a business of, and, uh, of keeping your brain um, active. And here is really the very extraordinary recent research. The sheer act of learning, we, we know with age, we lose brain cells, we lose neurons. The sheer act of learning, learning anything, creates new synapse and dendrites and connections in our brain. That is phenomenal news because maybe not like, anatomy is not necessarily destiny, folks. Um, so brain health certainly is a topic that we did cover also. Can we go to the next slide? Ah, yes. What happens if he retires first? We know that we have a really unique situation happening today where we have more dual income couples who are aging together. And we know that the timing of retirement really can become an issue. And there was some research done by Phyllis Mohn at the University of Minnesota. And she found there were some optimum conditions. The most optimum in terms of people being happy with their marital life is if both retire at the same time, okay? The next optimum situation is if he retires first and no, no, I'm sorry, yes, if, if, she retires, if she retires first and he's still working. The least optimum, as you might guess, is if he stays home and is retired and she continues working. Uh, there are not a lot of models, I think probably, any therapists in our group? Okay, are you seeing any older adult couples? No, are you seeing any older adult couples? 
No, okay. Well, the other thing is older adults typically don't go to therapists, <laughs> number one. And number two, if one of them goes, try getting your partner to go. <laughs> so it's not a generation that went into self-help. It was more stoic, be quiet about your problems, tough it out. Um, so it is not surprising that you don't, see, you don't see couples. We may see it in some kind of support groups at hospitals, perhaps. But nonetheless, uh, you know the line, I, better, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch, okay? <laughs> so could we, could we go to the next slide, please? A sorority house, not a nursing home. So we have talked about, many of the groups have talked about the what if. We don't like to think about it, but let's say we live to be 97, okay? And maybe we can't do all the things that we used to do. And maybe we need some support and assistance. People aren't jumping up and down to go into nursing homes, although there are nursing homes that are very good. It's not usually something people say, that's my destination point. Like, I can't wait to get into a nursing home. <laughs> we don't hear that. We don't hear that. So we did a pie in the sky. We said, well, what if we had renewment residences? A little bit based on the co-housing principle where people, like-minded people, get together, pool resources, maybe buy property or buy something where they organize who they want to live with into their old age. So as pie in the sky said, well, if we do that, we'll hire a concierge to manage our services. Instead of a driver, we'll have a chauffeur. Instead of a cook, we'll have a chef. Uh, we'll have Sherry at 4 p.m. and weekly chamber music. And aides will assist us um, as needed. And a handy person will install grab bars and change light bulbs for us. And we'll help each other. Maybe some would like to sew, some would like to cook, some would like to bake. We'll have certainly all the highest technology, wireless, internet, certainly a room with definitely the highest, highest form of technology. And um, at the library, we'll have a combined, we'll combine all of our library, books, CDs, DVDs. And we'll have an architect then build a couple bungalows in the back when our children want to come visit. And yes, we'll have a business manager who will negotiate rates for all of our needed services. Now, there is a model actually in Boston, and I am blanking on the name. Beacon Hill, Beacon Hill thank you. There is a model in Boston which is a model for aging in place, some of you are acquainted with it, where there is a nonprofit organization that has formed, there are many academics that live in Beacon Hill, it's in Boston, and many are alone, either men or women, and didn't want to move. Now it's an obscure neighborhood, okay? So they formed this nonprofit to allow people to stay in their homes, and they do have a driver, and they happen to have sherry in the afternoon, and they do have chamber music. And the piece which really struck me is that they have someone not only drive you to your doctor appointment, but that person stays with you and listens with you, occupies that third chair, okay? So there are other Beacon Hill models that are being developed. In a sense, maybe the renewment residence is somewhat like a Beacon Hill model, but I think that we're going to have different ways of, of living in older age. And I think the boomers and the silence are, and the architects, and our social conscious professionals are going to figure out ways to do it, okay? And I think we have one more that I wanna cover before we open it up for general discussion. Oh yes, forever guilty. Let me see where I have this one moment. Forever guilty, I think no religion, no ethnicity really has the market cornered on guilt, and I've just lost my page on this one moment. One moment, please. Okay, and I thought I'd read you a couple of things that made our women feel a little guilty. Okay, see if you can relate. <clears throat> Once we retired, <clears throat> we have all the ammunition we need to feel guilty. Okay, we feel guilty when we sleep until 8 a.m. We are still in our bathrobes at 10 a.m. We spend more than 20 minutes reading the newspaper and we have a glass of wine alone at 4 p.m. <laughs> we feel guilty when we spend a day doing just what we feel like doing, when we don't volunteer, when we hang out at Starbucks, 
when we don't exercise or we spend too much time exercising, when we eat too much or we gain weight. We feel guilty when we read in the middle of the afternoon, we get a massage in the middle of the afternoon, we do anything but work in the middle of the afternoon, and we feel guilty when we say no, when we don't take our mother out to lunch, when we can't wait for our grandchildren to leave, when we don't take our mother to the doctor, and, we don't want to, and when we don't want to listen to our children's problems. We feel guilty when we spend too much money, we have no understanding of our financial investments, we have no idea what a reverse annuity mortgage is, when we don't balance our checkbook, when we spend $400 on a cashmere robe, or $10,000 on a facelift, when we don't contribute to good causes or we spend $300 on a pair of shoes, or maybe $100 on a skin-firming moisturizer. <laughs> we feel guilty when we haven't bought a plot for ourselves, when we're jealous of a friend, when we have a tummy tuck or forget a friend's birthday, or even forget our own anniversary, or we feel guilty when we watch the housekeeper dust. We feel guilty when we want to drive at night, when we ask our maids to pick us up and drive us around the parking lot so we can find our car. We feel guilty when we lose our glasses, our cell phone, or our favorite pen, and we feel guilty when we just can't maneuver into that parking space. We feel guilty when we no longer want to throw dinner parties, when we serve Cheerios for dinner, when we do takeout food three times a week, and when we eat out seven times a week. We feel guilty when we don't spend enough time with our adult children, or don't spend enough time with our grandchildren, or we lie on the sofa all day with a cold, or we cannot drive our grandchildren to preschool, or we don't read all of those political emails. Actually, sometimes we feel guilty when we're just being good to ourselves. So a little bit on guilt. I don't know anything there you can relate to. One or two, three, four, maybe five items. So that is really all of the um, topics I wanted to share with you, and what I wanted to do now is just open it up for discussion. I will add that we are celebrating our 10th anniversary of Project Renewment because I got that call from Bernice actually 10 years ago, and this has been a viral kind of organic project. It was not strategic. It's kind of happens, word of mouth. And so if you have any questions, any, and I should say, if any of you are interested possibly in forming a group, um, come up to the front, maybe we'll cluster some people around and maybe you'll see if you want to start your own group. We're not advising it, we just say that's something that's available. So let's just open for general questions and thoughts to share. Please, do we need a microphone? Yes, we need a microphone. Okay. Is this what Jay Leno does? No. <laughs> or the other one? Thank you, Helen. Um, I really identified with a lot of what you said because I think a lot of the people here lived the uh, uh, Betty Friedan, uh, Gloria Steinem. We were the ones who created the inroads that the younger generation doesn't even understand what we did. And as a result, and me being one of those people, as a result, as I'm looking forward to retirement this year, I'm really ambivalent because I love my profession. I'm I'm a nurse practitioner and I also teach uh, nursing and I'm also in the Air Force Reserve and I'm retiring from everything this year. And, and, and I've worried about my loss of identity, who am I without my business card because I've worked so hard for so long. The renewment project, um, some of my friends and I, we call ourselves the Penny Candy Girls because we remember when Penny Candy was a penny. Um, <laughs> At the time we formed, you had to be 60 plus or minus two years to get in. And there's a stable group of us now who are out in the San Fernando Valley. And we do things together. Some of them are on a cruise right now. At any rate, the whole purpose of this, for me coming here today, was to find the issues, to not only identify the issues, which you did very well, but to find solutions. And the renewment sounds like a solution, but are there other places that we can go besides that? Thanks. It, unfortunately, this is not a cookbook exercise because everybody's unique and it's probably more of a process. Um, I think there are books you can read. Um, I think talking to people who have done this well and are pleased with what they're doing is a great source. Um, 
you know, and I, I probably can, you know, if you give me your card, I can give you maybe a list of books that you might look at. Because one of the key things is that work is such a, um, an indicator on what's important to you. In other words, if you're a contributor, or you are an influencer, or you've had some power, or you're creative, and this is what's driven you in your work, you can say, those are the things I have to take care of in this thing we call renewment or retirement. So I guess one of the things I would say, look at your work experience about what was the best parts, because we basically don't change. We just maybe express, it. we are who we are, but we may express it differently. If you've always been creative, you do something else creative. Okay, so um, I can get back to you. If you give me your card, I'll get you some, some books on it. Anyone, any other thoughts or comments you would like to share? Hernan, um, it seems to me like you guys just need to talk more to the younger, um, not audience, but your demographic, I guess. You have to make that your new goal in order to get out of funk of uh, like if you're worrying about retirement. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, a little bit more on that. Um, so the, the like kids would like to talk to you, oh. but they don't know how to approach you because you are so knowledgeable. Oh, de oh dear, that we, have to, we have to debunk that. But let me pick up on one item you said, and that is, we have one minute. We had a very, you, this is a, a project with unintended consequences. One is, we didn't form this so people would make new friends, but new friends were made. 65-year-old woman says, I never thought I'd make a best friend at 65, one. Two, we inadvertently have developed these small, enduring communities of women that have lasted anywhere, the newest is probably a year old, to 10 years. Um, third, at one of our book signings at, at um, Borders, my daughter, who's 40, brought her friends. We did this little presentation of book signing. She says, Mom, those issues, they're our issues. Authenticity. I mean, they, they all had careers, they have family, they're balancing everything, some are working. You know, who am I without my business card? Um, uh, energy, balance in life, those are topics which are important to us. I said, well, she says, we need a group. I said, go form a group, and she did. So now we have something called Project Renewment, the next generation of women in their 40s who are identifying with their transition issues. We're applying it to mid to later life, but there's some really fundamental transition issues. So when you say younger people, it has had some appeal to younger people to our shock and amazement. Yes, please, we have a... Could I make a request and a suggestion? Oh. I look around this room and I saw before, um, a few minutes ago, the place was packed. I think that means that there's a lot of really interested women and we're all looking for some answers. And you said yeah, we, you were would talk after in the front. May I request that you talk to all of us about starting how we start oh, chapters yeah, or fine. groups because okay. we do right here. Okay. And, and I'm right, sure there's probably other buzzing going okay, on. Okay, is that fine with everyone? We take a minute on this. All right, um, here's how it would work. Find eight to 10 women like-minded. And what, what makes a good group person? This is called speaking to the converted. Someone who's a good listener. Someone, I would say, not in high need, meaning if you really have, if you're de really, really depressed, you need to see a therapist. It's not gonna play out in the group, okay? Um, what makes someone who is a good person in a group? You listen, you participate, you don't have a need to control and you're interested in growth. You're interested in growth, okay? Um, and you're open. You're open to, to process and listen and, and contribute. So you would get eight to 10 women together, get their names, get their addresses, feel free to contact me. I have no problem coming to a first session to kick things off if you're not in San Francisco. I mean, I'd like to go there too. I would be happy to support the effort, and I know Bernice would too. Um, you know, the 30th, we're having a 10th anniversary celebration. If you're actually into a group, maybe we have you invited to that. It's gonna be a very interesting, um, an interesting event. So I would just say, identify, get a piece of paper out, take the names, phone numbers, um, emails, and 
as they say, talk amongst yourselves, pull yourselves together. Yeah, we got a lot of space around here and get, connect to each other. And I have to say, and I, I'm very g poor at promoting products. I can promote ideas and concepts, but the book happens to have how you do it in the last section. Bernice and I said, we don't wanna spend our time going around the country forming groups. It's not what we wanna do. They can do it. And so the curriculum is in there. It's, it, it's, it's, that's, just read it. The book, it's in the, uh, it's in the uh, lobby. It's called Project Renewment, the first retirement model for career women. And we have t-shirts to go with the book, right. if you're interested in the t-shirt. Um, what more can I say that would, would that be helpful? It's not, yeah, it, it, this, isn't, this isn't rocket ship science. And you know, women have a history of being very communal, okay? We had pajama parties, we did the commune business, we had the grocery communes, um, we had sororities. And my observation is when you go to a conference, women often share rooms with one another. I don't think men do. I've never kind of said. So women, I mean, women are communal. They connect, and they always have. And I think this is really capitalizing, if you will, on some of the innate aspects. We have men here. We love men. <laughs> the other piece is, and I've been asked this will be my parting piece. I've been asked, so what, what's your problem why you're not doing this for men? My experience is with working with 10,000 employees, men approach the topic very differently. And one of, and it could be current company excluded, men generally don't talk about this. <laughs> In about a nanosecond, you can get a dialogue going here. I mean, we did it. Men in general, my observation, go about this a little differently. You're on the golf course, you're at the gym, you're at a meeting, you might allude to this thing called retirement, but getting down to it, what the real issues are, they do it differently. Any comments? Okay, I, I, I'm glad there are exceptions. Okay, I need to repeat the questions and we're, f we're finished. I think the comment was that um, not all women were silent and we certainly had vocal ones and your mother or the woman who raised you was your mother? Yes. Y your mother was not a si Thank goodness she wasn't silent. So that's well, our role models. So with that, um, I hope that some of this is relevant to your life, that um, you look at your current state and your next 30 years with optimism, with creativity, with energy, and I do believe that Browning had it right, the best is yet to be. Thank you so much, you've been wonderful. The program was recorded at the Santa Monica Public Library and is brought to you in collaboration between the library, the Friends of the Library, City TV, and the California State Library. That's a wrap on another episode of Cool People, Places, and Things here on the West Side. For City TV, this is Lee Ehrenberg. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Great job, Lee. Is that a cut? We got it? Okay, we got guys. Lee. All right, thanks. See ya. Hey, where are you going? I got some personal business to take care of. Uh, come on, guys. Stop rolling, okay? I agreed to do a reality show about hot spots in Santa Monica, but I can't let you follow me to my living room. Lee, it's a library. What's the big secret? The big secret is that at Santa Monica Public Library, what you see is not just what's on the shelves. All right. It's against my better judgment, but 
Let's, as they say here at the old Biblioteca, let's check it out. I told you. This place is incredible. Isn't it? Yeah, it's got a super high green rating. It's Wi-Fi throughout. So the space actually feels alive, like a living room. Hey, Lee. Hey, what's going on, guys? How Back are you? again. Yeah, I'm always here, dude, huh? Oh, did you get our tweet? Yeah, is it 3 o'clock? Mm -hmm. 3 o'clock in the auditorium. All right, dude, I'm going to see you there, OK? All right. Later, okay. later, bye. bye. Friends of yours? No, those are librarians. No way. Yeah, they're all super cool. I even friended him on Facebook and I follow him on Twitter. That's how I know one of my favorite authors is speaking at 3 o'clock today in the auditorium. Hey, you want to grab a coffee and check it out? Coffee? Right this way, Miss First Time at the Library. Oh. It's a good latte, right? That's my line. Can I at least uh, have two uh, words? I'm sorry, what are you criticizing the writer? No, but I don't I mean, think you you're lucky to be in this if you weren't good looking. Seriously. <laughs> Heather, we put a lid on these. We can go inside, we can check out the latest CDs, DVDs, bestsellers. Yeah. Cool. That's great for you, but I don't live here. I live in the South Bay. Do you got a California driver's license or a photo ID? That's it. That's all you need for a library card. I'm out of here. What? Where are you going? Get my library card. Dwayne, let's go. Are you going too? Ah, oh, great. There goes the neighborhood. Hey guys, welcome to the It's Cool to Be Smart Club. Why don't you join the happening at Santa Monica Public Library, where the brains meet the beach at 6th and Santa Monica. Check us out today.